Thank you again uh, for being people that love Jesus. Amen? I really believe that this message today kind of goes heart and song along with what God's been doing in our lives and our ministry. As I shared, for those who get the e-blast, I was just in Central America. Very quick trip. Very, very fast-moving trip. I told Kathy, one thing about it, being gone about three or four nights like that, I felt like I was gone one night. It went so fast. Upon arriving in Belize City, immediately went to meet with some pastors uh, over the pastor's retreat that we do there and the conference we do for the pastors and setting that up. The next morning, I got up and drove into the interior of the land up by the Guatemalan border where we we're going to be doing our pastor's conference. Met with some hotel conference people, people providing the meals, took care of all those things. Drove back later that evening to uh, Belize City where I was kind of on the way back was asked to come speak to local pastors in Belize City just to share a word with them and had some time of encouragement and question and answer time and some ministry time that took place there, which I think was really, wasn't expecting to do, but it was a blessing. Didn't want to do because I was so tired, but you know, you, sometimes when you're tired, you go anyway, amen? But uh, got up early the next morning, caught the hip-hop flights down to the southern parts of Belize. You take it 15 minutes at a time to get down there, you know. It's up and down on these little airplanes. and uh, they, don't have a, they don't buy airplanes down there unless they can fix them with duct tape and, and vice grips or a hammer. And then they'll, they'll be part of the fleet. So you're, you know, you're praying, Lord, I know you said low I'm with you, but I'm praying you'll be with me high as well. So got down there and was able to meet. And I was really excited because the conference, that, the crusade that we're doing down there along with our mission trip, and working in a particular church, was able to talk to the pastor about what the physical needs for some of our men are going to be doing some work down there and plastering some walls in, in a church that's down there they're trying to get going. We'll be doing that as well as the schools and met, went to one of the local colleges there, talked to campus leaders and principals there, went over and met with the pastors where we were just going to have three or four churches involved in the crusade. Other pastors were invited to that meeting, so now we have eight churches committed to be a part of that crusade. So that's, that's a great uh, commitment from them. They went to the sports arena, were able to finalize a contract with them, went to hotels, finalize a contract. Anyway, you got the idea. A lot of running around negotiating and uh, at the same time turning around trying to be inspirational to those pastors and kind of cast a vision for them. Headed out, to, got back late that evening, got up early and came home. Amen. Uh, got out and kissed the ground. Praise the Lord. But uh, there's a lot going on and it's good to be a part of those things. And one of the most important things in our lives and all that goes on around us is this element I want to talk about today on faithfulness. And what I did at the Magnolia campus, I spread this out over a couple of sermons, and I'm going to do it all in one day because you're such fast listeners. Amen. But faithfulness is an important part of our life. And we just kind of give you a scripture to start with here in Proverbs 20, verse 6, where it says, You know, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. And that's the truth. Uh, the Good News Translation put it a little differently when it put it this way. Well, it's supposed to put it back. Let's go back. Try one more. It's not going to do it. Is there another scripture on the bottom of that page? No? Yes? We'll see if you can find it for me right there. Is it going to come up or is it going to go past it too? Not going to come up. But basically it says, it gives, it's, the translation goes like this, that uh, everybody talks about how loyal and faithful they are, but just try to find someone who really is. And that's the truth. A lot of people tell you how faithful they are, how reliable they are. People advertise it in the retail industry, but it's really hard to find somebody who wants to be committed. Committed to a church, committed to a business, committed to their marriage, committed to their, their, their job. Commitment is just a, it's, it's kind of a lost quality in the age that we live in today. So when I talk about faithfulness, I'm really talking about a, a person who is reliable, someone who's dependable, someone who's consistent, really someone who's trustworthy. So we need to be that kind of person. In, in Psalms 21, it says, Lord, help, you know, for the godly man are fastly disappearing from off the face of the world, face of the earth. Who can, who can find them? And the Living Bible puts it this way, they're fast disappearing. Where in all the world can dependable men be found? Dependable women be found? And if you look in this, especially in the culture we live in today, when everybody bails out of commitment so quickly, this is a lost character quality. And what we want to talk about today is being the kind of person that other people can depend on. And much deeper than that and much greater than that, I want to be, and you should all want to be as well, the kind of person that God really can depend on in the world that we live in. Someone that he finds trustworthy. We've talked about the passage from Chronicles where, where, the, where the prophet says, you know, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole world looking for someone whose heart is pure towards him. God's looking for someone to use. God's looking for someone to manifest his life in. God's looking for people that he can do something genuine, something lasting, something eternal. That, that's, that that person can be used by him. 
So it's important. What I want to talk about today is faithfulness. First of all, I want to talk about why should we develop faithfulness. The second thing we'll get to, the characteristics of a faithful person. And the last point, a very simple point, is how do we develop faithfulness? Why develop faithfulness? The first question is pretty simple. We should develop faithfulness because that we have a God and we have a Savior. We have Christ our Lord who is faithful. And if we're going to be like Him, and that's our heart's passion and desire, which also is the will of God, then you and I are going to have to be people who are consistent, trustworthy, and reliable. God is faithful. Three different ways that God speaks to us in His Word about being faithful. Let's just look at them very quickly. One, God's faithful to save us. I love this passage where it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship with His Son. What's that mean? God is faithful to save us. God, obviously, as you study scriptures, you'll see where God the Father and God the Son met in some heavenly council at some point in time in eternity. And Jesus came out of the meeting and he told his disciples something like this. All that my Father gives me, I will in no wise cast out. There's some relationship in eternity, and I believe it's the blood covenant that was sealed before the creation of the earth, before the foundations of the earth, where God the Father and God the Son knew that man would sin and fail. At the very beginning, before man's created, but sin was going to be dealt with by the Son, that he would come, live a righteous, perfect life, give himself up for us, live a faithful life, committed to the Father, and would faithfully go to the cross and die there for us and be risen from the dead. And God says to the Son, you know, everybody that comes to you will save, will, will, will change, will keep. And those who come, Jesus said, I'm not going to cast them out. So there's this relationship that it proves the faithfulness of God in saving us. But it goes beyond that. Not only is God faithful in, in saving us, God is faithful to keep us. Don't you love the passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? Except when you're looking for an excuse, obviously. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able. For you to sit back and say, well, the devil made me do it, or I just couldn't overcome that temptation. If Christ lives in you, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, you have what you need to be to be faithful. You have what you need to live a faithful life where God makes a promise to be faithful to you, to not allow you to get into a situation that will overcome you, that you'll have what you need when you need it. God is also faithful to forgive us. Praise the Lord for 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins. One of my favorite passages in all scripture because I have to claim it often. I don't know about you. Maybe you've arrived. I haven't. But anyway, the idea here is that if I do fail, God is faithful. He's reliable. He's trustworthy. There's no point in time where I'm going to go to God and say, okay, God, you know, I, I, I did, I, I sinned here. And I, I ask you to forgive me in Jesus' name. And he's not going to say to me, oh, I'm sorry, that's the last straw. Ah, you stepped over the line. That's one too many. We're not going to save you. They're not going to forgive you. We're not going to cleanse you. No, because God's reliable. His word is true. And Jesus' sacrifice for my sin satisfied the justice of God. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died for my sin. So for any other reason we should desire to be faithful, it's because God is faithful, point number one. Number two, you want to be used by God? Faithfulness is a qualification for ministry in the kingdom of God. First Timothy, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord that he considered me faithful, putting me in the ministry. This is the apostle Paul. He said, you know, God was faithful. He didn't say, you know, and, 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 and God is good. But you know, there's this point, if I wanted to be used, God's required me to be faithful. So I thank God that he noticed that, he recognized a quality which is like him, that he saw Christ in me, that he saw my willingness to be obedient to, to his word and to his will, and he allowed me to be a part of something. Every one of us that are children of God, every one of us, if you're saved, if you're a Christian, have been called to ministry. Well, I don't know about that. The Bible says that we are all priests. That's a ministerial role. We are priests unto the Lord. Every one of us have ministry. And if we're going to discover that and know what it means and really enjoy it because it should be something that should be enjoyed in our life, then we should come to the place to say, hey, I want to be faithful. And if you look at, you know, Paul's life, he's, we obviously see a picture of someone who is faithful. He writes a little later, he says, I'm, you know, I'm sending you Timothy. Who? You send him. I'm going to send Timothy. Why are you going to send him? Because he is faithful in the Lord. And he's going to remind you of my way of life in Christ. He's going to tell you what it means to live for Jesus. But why am I going to send him? I'm going to send him because he is faithful. 2 Timothy 2 says, The things you, Timothy, have heard of me through many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men 
who shall be able to teach others also. I'm going to send Timothy. He's faithful. You know what Timothy's going to do? He's going to do what I did. He's going to remind you about Jesus, and he's going to remind you to find other faithful people to remind you about Jesus. Faithfulness is a qualification for ministry in your life. The third thing I want you to see today is the, the reason why faithfulness is so important is, it is it's what guarantees the blessings of God and His grace upon my life. It really comes down to, if you want to know the secret of blessing in your life, to really know and sense the real presence and the grace of God in your life, I believe faithfulness is the key characteristic for that. The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and He ponders all His, go, all his goings. Some of you may be serving the Lord in some quiet fashion. People don't see it. People don't need, know about it. It's not advertised on TV. It's not produced on, the, in, in, on YouTube. Nobody sees what, what's going on in your life. And nobody knows what you're doing for Christ. But the Bible says God knows. God sees. And you may not get the applause of others and nobody may recognize your name. But most important thing is that God does. When you feel like nobody understands or nobody may care and nobody knows what's going on, it would do well to remember this passage. It says the ways of our, our ways are before the eyes of the Lord and he will ponder all of our going. It's important that we be faithful. If we're not faithful, we're not reliable. We all know what kind of problem that creates. Proverbs 25 says it's like a bad tooth. Our lame foot is reliance on the unfaithful in times of trouble. You had people like that in your life? You know, they say they're going to do something and they don't do it. It's just irritating and it's frustrating. I mean, you go, to, you, you go to the restaurant, you're expecting to have service at a table. I mean, you're going to pay for the meal and you expect a waiter to come over, you know, and at least bring a glass of water or something and they don't and time goes by or maybe they bring something and then don't come back for like an eternity. Am I the only guy that experiences that in the world? You know, that's, I, I believe I track those kind of waiters, I know. And I also know the sovereignty of God that he's trying to develop in me patience. You know, and I understand that. But at the same time, I also know this shouldn't be the quality of somebody you want to hire and put in a restaurant and in charge of, you know, meeting people's needs. If they're unreliable, they become like a bad tooth or a lame foot. They give the whole place a bad name. You know, they ruin business for the owner. And that's the way it is. If you're an unfaithful person on your job, People can't rely on you. It says you're like a lame foot. What's worse? You know, have, you, have you ever had a lame foot? I have. You know, I've had both of them lame at times where you just twist it or break it or something. And you can't put any weight on it. You can't depend on it. You can't rely on it. You'll collapse. A bad tooth? I've had a bad tooth and a lame foot at the same time. <laughs> that ever happened to you? It's miserable, isn't it? And there's nothing more miserable than a bad tooth. That's what it is like. The Bible says if we're unfaithful. That's the reaction that is caused by other people around us. It also not only prepares me in ministry, it prepares me for leadership in general. I love the book of Nehemiah. It's a great book on leadership and on faithfulness and integrity. Nehemiah was a man of integrity, and he talks about his brother, Hanani. And he said, he, being Nehemiah's brother, he said of his own brother, you know, I put him in charge over Jerusalem because he is a faithful man, and he feared God above many. The key word there is, first of all, he feared God more than he feared anybody else, all right? And he feared God more than anybody else around him. So that's the first qualification. But guess what? If you really do fear God, and this is a sign you do fear God, it's going to create faithfulness in your life. You're going to be a reliable person. So it, re it prepares me for, for ministry. In Matthew, in chapter 25, it tells us this. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? He's the one who his master has placed in charge of the other servants. If I'm going to be a faithful person, God says, if you're reliable, if I can count on you, I'm going to use you, and I'm going to bless you in using you, and I'm going to give you a place of leadership like Han and I. He said, I put him over others. I gave him a place of responsibility. But if I'm not faithful, then I can't be trusted in that kind of position. I mean, you've had teenagers who said to you, you as a parent, you just don't trust me. You used to tell my kids that they're teenage years, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. You're right. It is earned. And you get a little bit at a time. And if you're not faithful, the little bit you get, you're not, if you can't be trusted with that, then you can't be trusted with something bigger. And as my children learn to be trustworthy in an area, then you give them a little bit more trust. 
That's the same thing the Lord does with us. He's a better parent at it. He's a better judge of it. He sees all things, obviously. We don't always see those things as parents. But, you know, it's important that we understand that respect and trust and honor, those things that are earned in our life. And if we'll be honorable people, then we will be respected as an honorable person. But it's important we understand the small, simple principle of reliability. You say, I'm ready to do something for God or I'm ready to take a leadership role, but you haven't been proven faithful. Like Tim said, he's proven to be faithful. Then, then there's no place really until you get to that point. A lot of people join the church. We always tell people in our, in our 101 class, we're always looking for leaders, but it takes time. You know, you can't come in here in a week or two and be in charge over ministry. You say, well, I was on, I was on the elder board over here. I was a licensed minister. Or I, was a, I was a deacon over there. Good for you. Praise the Lord, but I don't know you. <laughs> and I'm responsible as a shepherd for the flock here. You come in, be excited about Jesus, fall in love with Jesus, your faithfulness will be seen. And it will be recognized. And you'll be, a, you'll be recognized. And God will put you in a place of ministry and leadership over other people. But it starts with being faithful with little so you can be the master over the much. You may have been, as I say, a pastor in, in, a, in a church somewhere. You may have taught Sunday school somewhere for 25 years. But you, if you don't have a track record around those people you're with, it, they won't respect you. People just don't, they just don't give away trust. So it takes some time. But hey, if we'll be faithful, it will prepare me for leadership. The fifth thing I want to show you is faithfulness will be rewarded in heaven. You know, there's about five or six different parables, at least in the New Testament, where faithfulness over what God's given us is the, the essential theme. We call it stewardship, you know. But God gives us and he gives us what we need and we need to be faithful over what he's given us. And over and over again, scriptures remind us that when God looks at our life, he's looking to see if we're going to be a faithful person. I mean, God can overlook my, my ignorance and God can overlook my lack of talents or personality. But what God does not overlook is if I'm going to be faithful with what he has given me. And if I'm not faithful with what he has given me, then why should I be given the trust of other things in my life? Matthew 25, you remember the story there where he's talking about the talents and the, and, and the faithful stewards, and he gave one so many talents and another some more and another a little less, but the last guy he gave one talent, and then after some time he comes back and he calls everybody to give an accounting and says, this one had given 10, and he gained 10 more, this one gave him five, and he gained five more. They all were out doing something with what they had been given. But he came to the last one, and what did he say to him? He said, what have you done? He says, nothing. I took the talent and I buried it in the ground. And he said, I want, here's what happens. You take from the wicked servant, the one who had the one talent, and you give it to them that have. Because he wasn't faithful with little, he won't be given any more. Now, sometimes we don't understand that. We kind of look at that talent, yeah, we need to be faithful. But you know what I gleaned from that verse? Really, the people sometimes that become the most unreliable, the most unfaithful, are the people with the minimal talent, the least bit. You know, they've been given a little bit, so it becomes an excuse not to do anything. I'll just take it and bury it. I'm not, I, I, I can't sing like somebody on the stage. I can't play an instrument like Dennis. I, I can't preach like Brother Joe. And, you know, I, I can't do women's ministry like Rebecca. And on and on the list goes. I, I don't have the personality. Or I don't have the charm or the wit or the looks or the money. All the excuses that people make, they minimize what they have. But God has given you something. Every one of us have been given something. And every one of us will be held accountable for what we do with what we've been given. Will we be faithful? When I went down to Belize to talk to those pastors, not only Belize City, down in San Ignacio especially, it's very poor churches, very little money. All the pastors are bivocational. They have to work for a living because the church can barely support them. I wanted to make this point to the pastors. Don't sit back and say, I can't be a part of something in the kingdom. I can't be a part of something big because I'm small. Because I don't have anything... I won't do anything. Isn't that way most people are? And I think that's what this parable really is addressing. Every one of us have something. And I was trying to make it clear to the pastors, you've been given that ministry. And what you do with that ministry and the resources and the people resources, as well as the financial, whatever it might be, even if it's little, you're still accountable for. That's why Jesus was so uh, applauding the woman that was the widow who had nothing and she came to the service and she stopped there at the treasury boxes and she cast in what she had. She had something. It wasn't much, but Jesus said she has given more than anyone else. And I'm sure the disciples saying, <laughs> I saw what she put in there. I saw one stinking little mite. You know, that's all she put in. That guy gave shekels. 
That guy gave a bunch of shekels. What's a mite? How can that be more? Because she gave sacrificially what she had. That's what makes it more. And Jesus says she cast in more than everybody else. And I think sometimes because we don't feel that we've been given a lot, we don't do a lot. Don't ever let that be an excuse. Say, well, I'm not the best at this or the brightest at that or this. It doesn't matter. You know? You do with what you've been given for the glory of God and see what God will do. I believe not only is it going to be rewarded now, obviously it's going to be rewarded in heaven. And every one of us are going to have to pass through that, what's called the Bema Seat of 1 Corinthians, where we stand before God and we give an account. And God says, all right, I gave you time. I gave you this. I gave you this life. I gave you that. What did you do with it? Well, I came to church. <clears throat> but what did you do with what I gave you? Well, I attended occasionally. But I, 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 I went to the retreat at church sometimes. But what did you do with what I gave you? And faithfulness is going to be the kind of person who says, you know, I realize that I may not have much, but I ain't going to take what I have been given, and I'm going to use it for the glory of God. And as a result of that, the Bible says that we will come to that point in our life where, we'll, where God will say to us, well done, you good and faithful servant. Come in to the joy of the Lord. That's why it's important we understand faithfulness. Well, I'm going to give you in about nine or ten minutes here, eight qualifications, so listen quite fast, of a faithful person. And if I go over two minutes, you'll, you'll forgive me because you're believers and you have to. <laughs> what are the characteristics of a faithful person? Say, I want to be a faithful. What will be the signs that I am a faithful person? One, your value system will be right. Proverbs 28, 20 says, A faithful man will be richly blessed, but one who's eager to get rich will go unpunished. Go read around those, those chapters around that verse there. On both sides of that, there's a lot of verses that talk about money. And it talks about literally verses that can be so strategically placed right in the center of our culture because we live in a materialistic world, especially in this Western Hemisphere world that we live in. Everybody's driven by more. I need bigger. I need better. I need more. And it's always, it's always what's appealing to people is that get rich quick or get rich quicker, have more, so I'll work harder and I'll, 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 I'll work overtime more and I'll get more so I can have more so I can keep up with the, whoever the more people are. <laughs> If you're a faithful person, you're not going to be easily drawn into that kind of lifestyle where it's all about getting more. You're going to begin to realize, you know, God called me to be a faithful person and I begin to understand what is really right and what's really important in life. And I'm going to invest my life in that which is the most value. I'm going to make my life count for the glory of God. I want to have my life have significance and not just to be, to be some kind of trivial thing. I'm not interested in how much more I can get. You know, I am blessed. One of the things that really blesses me as a pastor is so many of you who give so much of yourself, all right? And it's not for material gain. I mean, like on Sunday, these people gather up here Sunday after Sunday, get here early Sunday after Sunday, week after week, so faithful, not for any money. Nobody in, the, in, in this ensemble is, is paid, all right? They just get up here week in and week out, work hard, sacrifice their time, get up early, come to services, and commit them their ministries and their gifts and their talents to God, and they're here week after week serving Christ. Some Somebody ought to praise the Lord first of all. Amen. It would be easy to say, I'm not even going to go to church. You know, I can take some overtime at work. Some of them are in jobs where overtime is available. It would be easy to say, well, I don't want to be on Wednesday. Or I don't want to come on Sunday. Or I got to make another dollar. But if I go over here, I can make some more money. Well, I know church is important. You don't know church is important or you'd be in church. Amen. Don't fool yourself. Don't play games with yourself. You know what's important in life. And I say, well, I don't think church is real important. You need to read the New Testament. Jesus died for the church, his bride, and we make up that bride. We have a responsibility to be honorable to God in regard to his calling on our life, and it works through the body of Christ. And so we need to understand, it's not about me, not about what I can get or what the church can give me. We're living in a self-centered age. What's in it for me is the mindset. But that's the second point. A faithful person cares for others' interests, not just his own. I love this passage where it talks about Timothy in Philippians 2. He says, I don't have anyone like Timothy who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But Timothy, he's proved himself. He served me in the works of the gospel. Man, what a great testimony to have, amen? What a powerful word for someone to say about you. I don't have anybody like that guy. Everybody's interested in their own self. This guy's interested in, in the gospel. This guy's interested in you. This guy's interested in people. This guy's interested in, in souls. It's, it's, it's about relationships with this person. It's not about himself locking himself into his own little bitty world. 
But the contemporary culture we live in says, what's in it for me? What's my needs? What are you going to give me? What's my desires, my goals, my hurts, my values, my profit, my benefit? We just live in a selfish world, in a self-centered world. But the Bible gets, calls us to this place of being faithful, and that means I have to pull out from that, that little world that rotates around me and let it begin to revolve around the cross and Christ and ministry and people's, other people's life. And the Bible teaches us very clearly, if I'm going to be that kind of person, it will require a choice. I'm going to have to make decisions in my life. It would be easier for me to say no. It'd be easier for me, I need some rest. I need, I need to take care, you know, my own stuff. I got to have time. You know, my, I love this, my me time. Hey, people say, I, I need some me time. But Lord, you've got plenty of that. Amen? And the problem is most of us have too much me time. If you're going to be the kind of person God wants to use, it's going to be the faithful person. It's kind of like when you put a ring on somebody's hand as a husband or wife and you say, you know, those vows you made, you know what the key word there is? Faithfulness. You said you'd be you faithful. But you, we're not living in that culture. We've lost, you know, what it means to really understand the concept of commitment to another people. You know, what happens is, you know, he may not be having an affair, but his job's his mistress. She may not be having an affair, but something else is her partner. And they're being unfaithful because they're just thinking about themselves and what they can get out of life instead of what they can give to the other person. And I become unreliable, and at that point I become unlovely, unloving. So a faithful person is reliable. A third point about this characteristic, uh, the faithful person will live a life of integrity before an unbelieving world. You love this testimony of Daniel. And, his, and, and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, these were guys that lived it out in front of everybody. They didn't care what anybody else said. They wanted to be faithful to God first and foremost. Remember the Chaldeans that said they were jealous. They began searching for some fault and to find in, in Daniel who was handling and the way he handled his affairs so they could complain to the king about him. But they couldn't find anything to criticize. He was faithful and, he, uh, and honest and he made no mistakes. And mistakes in regard to how he dealt with people outside the church. You know, most people come to church today and they're in church, but when they get out in the world, they have no context of their Christian life. It seems they've lost center anymore. What they are in the world is completely different than what they are at the church. They're, they're like the hidden people we talk about, amen? They, they, they hide down there at the church. But when they get out to be the light and the salt of the earth, they're not being light and salt. They're just kind of adapting and just kind of going with the flow. They don't want to make any waves. They don't want anybody to criticize them. They don't want anybody not to like them or not to care about them or not promote them. And they are not what God called them to be. They're not living a life of integrity. What kind of reputation do you have outside? What kind of reputation do you have at school? People recognize, can they say about you, that guy's a Jesus freak. <laughs> All right, guys one of those Christians, they're a believer, they know that you know Jesus or not. Are you so busy trying to be like everybody else? How about at your work, where you live, in your neighborhood? Do people know that you're a believer and you have the, Christ is the center of your life? If you're faithful, they do. Maybe you're in HR at your work, human resources. Are you responsible for hiring people? What kind of people you want to hire? I would hope you want to hire people that have some integrity that are trustworthy. What I need to ask myself, wherever I'm working, am I really trustworthy? Am I always looking and complaining? I don't make, they don't pay me enough. I'm working too, you know, they want me to do this. Or are you saying, you know, I'm going to prove to be as faithful as I can here is a testimony for Christ Jesus. I'm not trying to get more of this and more of that and see what's in it for me. You know, I'm going to invest my life in, in, in this, these people here. And I'm going to prove to be a faithful person no matter what it takes. You live a life of integrity. And that's one of the things about ministers that are called to live that kind of way says if you're going to put them in a place of leadership, they need to have a life and a testimony. Number four, a faithful person keeps his word. Like clouds and winds without rain is a man who boasts of gifts that he does not give. What's that mean? That means you tell somebody you're going to do it, do it. You know, if you, if you tell somebody, I'll get back to you later, get back to them later. If you tell somebody, you know, I'm going to do that, you know what you need to come back? You need to come back and do it. If you say, I'll do it tomorrow, you don't need to do it a week later. If you say, I'm going to take care of it now, then take care of it now. Tell somebody, say, well, I'm going to pray for you, then pray for them. Whatever you say, the Bible says, do it. No matter what it takes, no matter what it costs, you ought to have the kind of attitude in your life that says, hey, even if there's a sacrifice involved, you know, I'm going to keep my word and I'm going to keep my promise. Proverbs 20, verse 25 says, it is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later consider your vow. What's that mean? It means don't sit down and make a promise, then let them say, oh, I should have made that promise. I'm not going to do that because I didn't realize it was going to cost me that. I didn't, I didn't know it was going to take that much time. That people come to church like that, you know. I want to get involved in this ministry. Oh, you mean it's going to take time? 
I just wanted my name on the bulletin. <laughs> I wanted some recognition. Oh, you mean people wouldn't like me if I did? The, hey, we just kind of back out at our own convenience. You ever notice it's easier to get in something than it is to get out of something? Say, so what do you mean? It's easier to get in debt than out of debt. Amen. That's why he's saying, don't, don't do things rashly. You know, don't promise to do something. It's easier to get in a relationship than it is out of a relationship. It's easier, it, it, it's easier to, to fill up your schedule than to fulfill your schedule. So he says, you need to consider what you say because you need to do what you say you're going to do. Psalms 15, verse 4 says, what, Whoever does what he promises, no matter how much it may cost, will always be secure. In other words, you do what you promise, God says, I'm going to make sure you're secure. I'm going to take care of you. That's the important thing. So we need to ask ourselves, am I making promises that I'm keeping or not keeping? That's promise to spend more time with my kids and promise to spend more time with my wife or I promise to spend more time with my husband or I promise to take them on a vacation that I promise to repair the faucet and still hadn't done it? Jesus put it this way. If you're going to be a man of integrity, a woman of integrity, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. If you said you'd do it, do it. If you said no, then it's no. If you said yes, then it's yes no matter what. That's the important thing about integrity and faithfulness. The fifth characteristic is this. A faithful person will develop and use their spiritual gifts. This is assuming you're a Christian. Because that's the only way you're going to have genuine integrity in your life. There's a lot of good people who are good people, all right? But if you really want to have the internal fortitude to do and to be a faithful person, then it's going to take God in your life. God never intended you to live your life without Him, all right? So you commit your heart and your life to Christ. And then well, guess what God does? God commits his heart and his life to you. He puts Christ in your life. He puts his Holy Spirit in your life. He gives you spiritual gifts. And then Peter says to the church, everybody should use whatever spiritual gift they've received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in various forms. In other words, the spiritual gift you've been given is God's grace. And it comes in all different kinds of ways, whether it's helps, whether it's, whether it's giving, whether it's serving in some capacity, or whether it's speaking or teaching, all these gifts that God gives, find out what yours is and you do it. And you do it faithfully to serve other people. You don't do it for yourself, you do it for the glory of God. And you do it to minister to other people. And the Bible says that's what a faithful person is. And you'll never discover that if you're just kind of wrapped up. Your, your, your Christian life, it just kind of consists of, I'll attend. You're going to miss the beauty of your life that God has for you. You're going to miss the, the, the glory of being used by God. I want you to know as a Christian who's been doing this for a long time, serving Christ now for 38 years, I've discovered the time that I am truly the most blessed, the truly the happiest, truly feel the most peace is when I'm doing just what God wants me to do. The rest of the time, I'm always struggling, looking for answers. Why is my life empty? It won't be empty if you fill it up with Jesus. You use what God's given you. Number six, a faithful person will manage his money well. So I won't go into this link. We just did a couple sermons on this. But it says, and remember in Luke 16, we shared that verse. If you haven't been faithful in handling the worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with true riches? Where God says to us, you know, I have blessed you. I have, I've entrusted you with things. And so you need to be faithful to use the things that I've given you to honor me. In other words, a faithful person doesn't argue about giving. They don't fuss about it. They realize that God's blessed them. I mean, every one of us have been given gifts, not just in the, in the sense of our spiritual life, but the gift of a career, the gift of a job, the gift of a home. All these things that God's given you, those are blessings from God. And I need to be faithful to God. You know, First Corinthians says, you know, everyone should lay aside each week what God has blessed you with, you know, and you should give it. Don't give it, don't give it little bits. Give it graciously. and Give it faithfully. But what do we lay aside? We talk about tithe, but let me give you a little better definition. It's really first fruits is what it all gets down to. I don't give God the last of my money after I paid the bills. I give God the first portions of my money before I pay the bills. Now that's a biblical principle where it talks and guarantees the blessings of God on my life. Are you the kind of person, well, let me pay center point? You know, and, and, and let me pay the water bill and the trash bill, and let's not forget the Chrysler or AM or GM or whoever, you know, him. I got to take care of all this. And there's a little something God for, okay, I'll give a little God tip here. And we miss it out. What God wants to do. God said, I, you know, I, I have this little acid test here for you on faithfulness. Be faithful material things. I'll see if you're really a faithful person. Because if you can't be faithful material things, how can I trust you with that which is spiritual? the deeper and the greater riches. Number seven, a faithful person obeys God's commands. 
Samuel speaking, he said, I'm going to raise up a faithful priest to serve me and whatever, this is the Lord speaking through Samuel, and to do whatever I tell him. You know how you can tell you're a faithful person for the Lord? You just keep his commands. What's the Lord leading you to do? That's what you'll do. What's Christ saying to you? That's what I'll do. I've experienced the great grace, riches, and blessings of God all my life, and I want to continue to experience in my life. So, you know, God's commands aren't grievous. They're, they're, they're based on love. Since I love Jesus, I'm going to do what he wants me to do. And guess what he does? As I do what he wants me to do, he says, hey, that's a faithful priest. How do I know I'm a faithful priest? I said, we're all priests of the Lord. How do I know I'm a faithful priest? I will do what God said to do. And the eighth, and I probably went more than eight to ten minutes. A faithful person passes on to others what they learn. That's what Paul was writing about Timothy. You know, he said he's going to the same as Timothy. And I shared the scripture here. You know, he's going to teach. He's going to teach you. He's going to tr turn it over to people that are trustworthy. Commit the things of faithful men who will be able to teach others. Is what he said. The Bible, First Corinthians. It's required for those who've been given a trust to prove faithful. Just to be faithful. What's God saying? I've given you a trust. You have my Son, your Holy Spirit. You have my Word. You have the Gospel. You've been saved. Now you use what I've given you so that other people can experience what you've experienced. That's a faithful person. A faithful person shares what they've been given. And if I'm not sharing what I've been given, then I'm not, then I'm not a faithful person. The third point of the sermon was this. How do you develop faithfulness? How do you become a faithful person? Galatians 5 wraps it all up when he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit being love and joy and peace. If you look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's all one fruit, but one facet of that fruit is faithfulness. The only way I can really be a faithful person, God gives me that grace. God gives me what I need. God gives me the strength. God gives me the power. God gives me the courage. God gives me the faith. God gives me everything I need so I can be faithful. I cannot do it on my own. Choices are made. But if I'm choosing. I'm choosing to trust His strength. I'm choosing to believe Him for His power. I'm choosing to embrace His Word. I'm choosing, and every time I make that choice, God is filling, He's empowering, He's strengthening, He's giving me everything I need. And that's the beauty of, of this whole issue of faithfulness because if we look at it, we, most of us say, I just don't have what it takes. But God does, and God gives to every one of us what we need to be a faithful person. And I said to be in the middle of this sermon, God, will, God rewards us. And I do believe it. Not only He rewards us here, He rewards us in eternity. But what's He rewarding us on? Based upon our faithfulness. We're doing a great study in grace in our left studies. But we understand that the Bible says the grace of God teaches us that we should deny ungodliness and we should walk worthy of the Lord and live in sanctification and to be obedient to Christ and to be faithful. Because we have God's grace. I'm not doing these things, and I'm not being a faithful so I can, I, can, I can earn my salvation or be sanctified. No. I'm doing these things out of my love relationship with Jesus Christ to have His integrity flow in me and through me so that when I am faithful, people can look and say, there's something unique about Him. It's got to be God. It's got to be Jesus. Because that's what makes us and drives us and fills us and empowers us and encourages us. It's Jesus in us as we're surrendering to Him daily making the right choices. Would you stand with your heads bowed?